Chapter Five of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Five on a Mud Bank. Halloa, Fairy Ho. Here you are, sir. Who is that singing out? It is I, Kate Quarm. What, Kitty Alone? Is that what it is to be? Over the water together, Kitty Alone and I. On the strand, in the gloom, stood a sturdy figure encumbered with a hat box and a large parcel, so that both hands were engaged. Are you John Pook? To be sure I am. In another moment the young fellow was beside the boat. Here, Kitty alone, lend a hand. I am crippled with these precious parcels. This blessed box hat has given me trouble. The string came undone, and down it went. I have to carry the concern tucked under my arm and the parcels bursting. It's my new suit dying to show itself, and so is getting out of the brown paper envelope as fast as it may. We are very late, said Kitty anxiously. The tide is running out hard, and it is a chance if we get over. Right, Kitty. I'll settle the hat box and the new suit. Brass buttons. What do you think of that? And straps to my trousers. I shall be fine. A blazer, Kitty. A blazer. Do sit down, John. It is but a chance if we get across. You are so late. The atmospheric did it. For one, my hat the other, tumbling in darkness out of the box. And in the tunnel, too. Fancy if the train had gone over it. I'd have wept tears of blood. Do, John Pook, do sit down and take an oar. I'll sit down in a minute, when I've put my hat box where neither I nor you can kick it about, and the new suit where the water can't stain it. John, you must take an oar. Right I am. We'll make her fly. Piss, faster than the blessed atmospheric, and no sticking halfway. I'm not so sure of that. Kate thrust off. She had altered the pegs, and now she gave John an oar. Pull for dear life, she said. Not a moment is to be lost. Yoix away, shouted Pook. So we swim, Kitty alone and I. Kate, more easy now that the boat was started, said, you asked me my name. I said Kate Quarm. Well, but everyone knows you as Kitty alone. And everyone knows you as Jan Tootle, but I shouldn't have the face to call you so. And I don't see why you should give me any name than what properly belongs to me. Your father always so calls you. You are not my father, and have no right to take liberties. My father may call me what he pleases, because he is my father. He is my father, you my penny fair. And the penny fair has no rights. He has right to be ferried over, not to be impudent. Pook whistled through his teeth. The girl labored hard at the oar. Pook worked more easily. He had not realized at first how uncertain was the passage. The tide went swirling down to the sea with the wind behind it, driven as a besom. I say, Kate Quorm, no, Miss Catherine Quorm, hang it, how stiff and grand we be. Do you know why I have been to Exeter? I do not, Jan. There, you called me Jan. You'll be titling me Tootle next. That gives me a right to call you Kitty. Once, but no more, and Kitty only. I've been to Exeter to be rigged out for Sister Sue's wedding. My word, it has cost four guineas to make a gentleman of me. Can they do that for four guineas? Now don't sneer. Listen, they took my measure of four, and they put me in my new suit, brass buttons and everything complete, and a new tie and collar standing to my ears, and a box hat curling at the sides like the waves of the ocean. And then they told me to walk this way, please, sir. So I walked, and what should I see but a gentleman stately as a duke coming towards me, and I took off my hat and said, Your servant, sir, and would have stepped aside. Will you believe me, Kate? It was just myself in a great cheval glass, as they call it. You'll be at the wedding, won't you? If only to see me in my new suit. I do believe you'll fall down and worship me, and I shall smile down at you and say, Halloa, is that my good friend, Kitty alone? and you'll say, your very humble servant, sir. That I shall never do, Mr. Pennyfair, laughed Kate, and then becoming grave, immediately said, do pull instead of talking nonsense. We are drifting. Look over your shoulder. So we are. 
There's comb cellar's light, right away upstream. The wind and stream are against us. Pull hard. John Pook now recognized that he must use his best exertions. Hang it, he said, watching the light. I don't want to be carried out to sea. Nor do I. That would be a dear pennyeth. Pook pulled vigorously, looked over his shoulder again, and said, Kate, give up your place to me. I'm worth more than you and me together with our one oar apiece. She moved the rowlock pins, and Jan took her place with two oars, but the time occupied in effecting the change entailed loss of way, and the boat swept fast down the estuary. This is more than a joke, said Pook. We are down opposite Sheldon. I can see the Tameth lights. We shall never get across like this. We must. The tide tears between the end of the den and the farther shore like a mill race. We must cross or run aground. Kate, can you see the breakers over the bar? No, but I can hear them. They are nothing now, as wind and tide are running off shore. When the tide turns, then there will be a roar. I believe we are being carried out. Thunder! I'm not going to be swept into kingdom come without having put on box hat a new suit and cutting a figure here. The wind poured down the trough of the Tyne Valley with such force that in one blast it seemed to catch the boat and drive it as it might take up a leaf and send it flying over the surface of a hard road. The waves were dancing, foaming, uttering their voices about the rocks of the ness, mumbling and muttering on the bar. If the boat in the darkness were to get into the throat of the current, it would be sucked and carried into the turbulent sea. It might, however, get on the bar and be buffeted and broken by the waves. Take an oar, said Pook. We must bring her head round. If we can run behind the den, we shall be in still water. Or mud, said Kate, seating herself to pull. Anything but to be carried out to sea. The two young people struggled desperately. They were straining against wind and tide, heading about to get into shallow water and out of the tearing current. After a while Kate gasped, I'm finished. Her hair was blown round her head in the gale, with the rapidity of her pulsation, lights flashed before her eyes, and waves roared in her ears. Don't give up. Pull away. Mechanically she obeyed. In another minute the strain was less, and then the boat was aground. If this be the den, all right, said Pook. We can get ashore and walk to Tymouth. He felt with the oar standing up in the boat. It sank in mud. Here's a pretty pass, said he. I thought it bad enough to be stuck in the tunnel when the atmospheric broke down, but it is worse to be fast in the mud. From the tunnel we could extricate ourselves at once, but here, in this mud, we are fast till flow of tide. Kitty, I mean Kate, make up your mind to accept my company for some hours. I can't help you out and can't get out myself. What is more, no one on shore, even if we could call to them, would be able to assist us, Till the tide turns, we are held as tight as rats in a gin. I wonder, said the girl, recovering her breath, what makes the tides ebb and flow? I don't know, and I don't care, said John Pook. It is enough for me that they have lodged us here on a mud bank in a March night with an icy east wind blowing. By George, I've a mind to have out a summons against the atmospheric company. Why so? for putting us in this blessed fix. The train came to a standstill in the tunnel by the parson and clerk rock, between Dawlish and Tymouth. We had to tumble out of the carriages and shove her along into daylight. That is how my bandbox got loose. As I got out of the carriage, the string gave way, and down went the box in the tunnel, and opened, and the hat came out. There was an east wind blowing like a blast of a blacksmith's bellows through the tunnel, and it caught my new hat and carried it along, as if it were the atmospheric train it had to propel. I had to run after it and catch it, all in the half-dark, and all the while the guard and passengers were yelling at me to help and shove along the train. But I wasn't going to do that till I had recovered my hat. I must think of Sister Sue's wedding, and the figure I shall cut there, before I consider how to get the train out of a tunnel. In spite of discomfort and cold, Kate was constrained to laugh. If you or I are the worse for this night in the cold, and if my box hat has had the nap scratched off, and my new suit gets stained with sea water, I'll summon the company, I will. What have you got to keep warm, Kate? A shawl. Let me feel it. 
Pook groped in the dark and caught hold of what the girl had cast over her head and shoulders. It's thin enough for a June evening, said he. It may keep off dews, but it will not keep out frost. Please goodness, we shall have neither hail nor rain. That would be putting an edge on our misery. Both lapsed into silence. The prospect was cheerless. After about five minutes, Kate said, I wonder why there are twelve hours and a half between tides, and not twelve hours. I am sure I cannot tell, answered Pook listlessly. He had his head in his hand. You see, remarked Kate, if the tides were twelve hours exactly apart, there would always be flow at the same hour. I suppose so, Pook spoke languidly, as if going to sleep. But an extra half hour, or something like it, throws them out and makes them shift. Why is it? How can I say? Accident. It cannot be accident, for people can calculate and put in the almanacs when the tides are to be. I suppose so. And then, why are some tides much bigger than others? We are having high tides now. Pook half rose, seated himself again, and said in a tone of desperation, Look here, Kitty. I ain't going to be catechized. Rather than that, I'll jump into the mud and smother. It's bad enough having to sit here in the wind half the night without having one's head split with thinking to answer questions. If we are to talk, let it be about something sensible. Shall you be at Sister Sue's wedding? I do not know. That depends on whether Aunt will let me go. I want you to see and worship me in my new suit. I may see. I shan't worship you. I almost bowed down to myself in the cheval glass. I look so tremendous fine. And if I did that, what will you do? Many a man worships himself whom others don't think much of. There you are at me again. Fancy, Kate. Ducks. And green peas? No, bottle green. Ducks is what I am going to wear, with straps under my boots. Lily white. And a yellow nankeen waistcoat and a bottle green coat with brass buttons, all here in this parcel, and the hat. My honor, I was never so fine before. Four guineas with the hat. Do you call this talking sensible? asked Kate. Again they subdued into silence. It was hard in the piercing wind, in the darkness, to keep up an interest in any topic. The cold cut like a razor. The wind moaned over the bulwarks of the ferry boat. The mud exhaled a dead and unpleasant odor. Gulls fluttered near and screamed. The clouds overhead parted, and for a while exposed tracts of sky, thick strewn with stars that glittered frostily. Presently the young man said, Hang it, you will catch cold. Lie in the bottom of the boat, and I will throw my coat over you. But you yourself will be chilled. I, I am as tough as nails, but stay. I know something better. I have my new bottle green coat, splendid as the day. You shall have that over you. But it may become crumpled. Sister Sue shall iron it again. Or stained. You shan't die of cold just to save my bottle green. Lie down. I wish the hat could be made to serve some purpose. There's no water in the boat. None. And I am glad. It would have gone to my heart like a knife to have to bail it out with my box hat. Kate was now very chilled. After the exertion and the consequent heat in which she had been, the reaction had set in and the blood curdled in her veins. The wind pierced the thin shawl as though it were a cobweb. Pook folded up his garments to make a pillow for her head, insisted on her lying down so that the side of the boat might in some measure screen her from the wind, and then he spread his new coat over her. There, Kitty. Hang it. We are comrades in ill luck so there is a brotherhood of misery between us. Let me call you Kitty, and let me be Jan to you, Tottle, if you will. Only when you begin to boast about your new suit. There, Kitty, don't be hard on me. I must think of something to keep me warm, and what else so warming as the thoughts of the ducks, and Nankeen, and Bottle Green, and the box hat. I don't believe anything else could make me keep up my spirits. Go to sleep, and when I feel the boat lift, I will sing out. Kate was touched by the kindness of the soft-headed lad. As she lay in the bottom of the boat without speaking, and he thought she was dozing, 
he put down his hand and touched the clothes about her. He wished to assure himself that she was well covered. Kate was not asleep. She was thinking. She had not met with much consideration in the short span of her life. Lying in the boat with her eyes fixed on the stars, her restless mind was working. Presently, moved by an uncontrollable impulse, she asked, John, why do some of the stars twinkle and others do not? How should I know? I suppose they were out on a spree when they ought to have been in bed and now can't keep their eyes from winking. Some, however, burn quite steadily. Them's the good stars that keep regular hours and go to bed when they ought. Your eyes will be winking no end tomorrow. John, what becomes of the stars by day? Kitty, Kate, don't ask any more questions or I shall jump overboard. I can't bear it. I can't indeed. It makes my head ache. End of chapter 5